Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Omoja Fine Arts here in the Crossroad Building in Southfield, Michigan. We're so honored to have our extinguished um, guests here. We want to thank you for stopping in this afternoon to hear the Rosemary Summer speak on our heart, or excuse me, on our artwork and go in depth, giving you some of the historical perspectives. We also want to thank Calibri for being here and being our host. I'm Ian Grant, your gallerist. I also have Marcel Stewart, our gallery manager here, and I want to thank everybody again. And Rose, we look forward to hearing your conversation this afternoon. Thank you. Well, y'all can give him a round of applause. That's Ian Grant. <laughs> Don't do him like that. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump right into it uh, here at uh, Emoja Fine Arts Gallery on this fine Saturday. So okay. I'm here with the wonderful, the talented, the only Rosemary Summers. Uh, I want y'all to give a, a round of applause real quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Rose, you told me I am a doer and I ain't scared of nobody. <laughs> Who is Rosemary Summers? Can you elaborate on that? Okay, well, let me tell you who I am. But first of all, before I go into it, I um, want to give thanks to um, Jehovah God uh, for giving me this beautiful gift of art. It was with me at a little, as a little girl, I knew I was an artist, as well as uh, his son, Jesus Christ, for his ransom sacrifice so that all of us could have the opportunity to live forever on the paradise earth. And I also want to thank my husband, Mr. Alfred Summers, my best friend for um, always being there for me. We go all the way back to 1973. Uh, he hired me as an artist for Ebony Productions at Michigan State University. And so I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Summers, for all of your support and love as well as my beautiful daughter, who's also an artist, and she's a technology expert, and she taught me all of my technology skills. So that's why I'm able to really act up on social media, because Melanie has taught me well. <laughs> and so and then I want to thank, last but least, uh, my Facebook friends, my Instagram friends, all of my collectors here today, all of the would-be collectors, Ms. Tangi Grant, for uh, not only being a collector, but for being a supporter of my art. I truly appreciate it. And um, for all the would-be collectors, welcome, and thank you for coming to my talk. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that well, I'm not scared of anything. What you're you not scared of anything. You've had a broad career. Um, as a creative period, mm -hmm. and I wanted to get into your journey as an artist. You've been painting since you were well, teaching and painting since you were nine years old? Yes, I started painting, um, well, actually drawing on brown paper bags as a little girl. I think um, what happened with me was I realized early that, you know, the, the environment I grew up in was basically gloomy. You know, we're talking dull colors. Um, we're here in Michigan, so in, in the wintertime, you just got this whole gray vibe going. Uh, in elementary school, I don't know if some of you remember 1950s, 60s elementary school, there was that dull green paint on the walls. And um, I was hungering for color. Mm -hmm. And it was um, in my library class that I used to go to, uh, I would pick up this book called My Book of Fairy Tales. And I didn't really pick up the book to read it, but I picked up the book to explore the beautiful illustrations, the, the uh, intense colors um, on the pages just drew me in. And so I think it imprinted, actually, because I would read this book or just absorb the beautiful illustrations every single day. That was my thing to do um, during library. So these are the kind of things that developed my interest in art. Mm -hmm. And it translates. We can see everybody was talking before the interview about how your colors jump out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you had spoke about, could you tell us about the Afro-Cobra Afro -cobra movement and uh, your participation in that? Well, um, 
Mr. Paul Goodnight, whom I had a, uh, the, the honor of having a show right here in this gallery in 2019, uh, he actually introduced me to the Afro-Cobra movement. Mm -hmm. What is uh, the Afro-Cobra? The Afro-Cobra movement was basically a movement of black artists who, now don't quote me on this because this is hitting the media, so I'm going to have it all messed up. Google it, everybody. Just Google it. <laughs> But primarily, um, black artists in the 1960s and 70s had their own style and way of projecting uh, art on canvas, on murals. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly enough, the work that I created looked similar to that work. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when Ms. Mr. Goodnight was talking to me about the type of art that I create, he said, you know, you're straight out of the Afro-Cobra movement. Mm -hmm. And so, but you can really Google it and take a look at the artistry and what was going on at that time in the 60s and the 70s. Mm -hmm. I love that. I just want to stress that she said that in the 60s <laughs> and mm -hmm. the 70s, um, you've been creating for that long. Yes. Um, in fact, you were one of the first people to create a mural here in this city? That I know of. Okay. Now. Here in Detroit, back in 1969, um, 1970, I had an opportunity to paint a mural on the walls of a community organization I helped found it called Operation Get Down. Um, the director was Bernard Parker, uh, Barry Hankerson, Aaliyah's uncle. Uh, they founded this organization, myself, my mom, Francis Messenger, uh, back in 1969, 1970. And we finally acquired a building on Harper and Gratiot about 1971. And there was a lot of wall space. And so Bernard asked me, hey, would you like to paint a mural? And I thought, yeah, that would be, that's, that's a good idea. And so uh, I painted this beautiful mural that was on the wall for quite some time. So, but I don't know of anybody else. I didn't hear anybody talk about other people painting murals at that time. But I, I, I painted a mural in, a, in, in about that time. Yeah, yeah. and we, we familiar with, everybody's familiar with Operation Get Down? That's a okay. big deal. That's okay. a big deal. You had roots in that. Yeah. Okay. So you also, um, I mentioned that you had a very broad career in art that involved teaching as well. Yeah. Could you tell us about some of your, um, some of the programs you developed and some of the things that you did to put art in action? Art has always been my go-to way of expressing myself and escaping what I call the ugly, whatever the ugly is. Mm -hmm. And so at, at, at a very early age, around 15, I was teaching art classes at Operation Get Down to the um, youth in my community. And then as time progressed, I um, started teaching art classes at summer camps. So we would take a group of students or children up to summer camp under the auspices of New Detroit Incorporated. There would be about 150 young people between the ages of 12 and 16 and I would create all kinds of art pro programs for them. Um, I went to M Eastern Michigan University and got my master's degree in special education. And they wanted, they needed teachers really um, badly for children who were labeled emotionally impaired. And so, and my whole thing was, let's hurry up and get certified so I can get paid. <laughs> so they said, well, if you're going to get certified as a teacher who teaches children who are emotionally impaired, um, you know, we can speed the process up. So it was a good deal. Long story short of it, I found that the children that I came in contact with, was they were just wounded. These are people who were thrown away early in life mm -hmm. during that developmental time when you needed love and recognition, and you needed direction. And these young people, unfortunately, wasn't given that. So when they came to my classroom, um, these people were just wounded souls. So what I did was I converted my classroom into an oasis of beauty. 
I went and, and purchased about 15 tropical plants, plants that I know that they've never seen before in their lives. I also included a big armchair so that they could relax and go to sleep in because sometimes they had long nights. And also created a wall from the National Geographic images of people from all over the world so that um, they could, uh, to pique their interest. And then we, I developed a art program for my students. And I did this to boost their self-esteem, to help them see what it feels like to accomplish something, and to feel the feeling of commendation when people you know, commented on their work, and also to make some money. So they did all of that, and uh, it was just beautiful. And without going into a long, drawn-out story, because I did many, many different programs, but one in particular that touches my heart, it was uh, around 19, 1996. Um, at this time, there was always in the, in the educational industry, the thought that crack babies was gonna, we were, we were gonna eventually get children who came from crack addicted people. Mm -hmm. And so the children came. And, and I had about 16, 17 in my classroom. And they were all over the place. I mean, they could not sit down for anything. So what I did was I told them, I said, you know, you're gonna learn percentages, how to do math, but we're gonna just focus on percentages because you're gonna make money. So telling somebody that's never made any money that they're going to make money gets their interest. I don't care how squirmy or <laughs> EI they are. <laughs> and so that's basically what we did. We sat down, created these paper mache masks. Um, there was a lady named Jan who had the um, Art Exchange Gallery on Woodward who gave us the opportunity to hang the mask in her gallery. I have a friend. Um, Joan Crawford, she came, and she's a vocalist, a jazz vocalist. She sang, and she had a trio with her. Uh, food was catered. The parents came. People bought the mask. The children made money. They were excited. They were happy. Uh, many different things happened internally. The children calmed down, and the children started learning. So that was like one of my big uh, successful projects that I uh, have used art for. Bless you for that. Oh, a clap. Well, round of applause oh. for that. Right. It's showing you how powerful art can be when you put it into action and when you have people like yourself who are dedicated and passionate enough about the people to put art in action. Okay, so uh, we brought up the store, the art exchange. I wanted to roll into, because you had mentioned um, it made them want to learn, um, and I know that we spoke on... Um, a partnership, well, just working with your family in general. So mm -hmm. I guess we're kind of segueing. <laughs> um, sorry, Al, we bringing you into it, but I know you just, he, you were saying that um, your husband had developed a software to help the students learn mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. where else they might want to fit once they got a thirst for life. Yes. Could um, you tell us a little bit about? Well, about the same that. time that I was working with these children, along with the school social workers, my husband and his friend, uh, Mary Fields, uh, had developed this technology uh, way before it became um, a common trend. Um, this technology that children could use to, number one, identify their aptitudinal skills, and number two, to identify what occupations they were best suited for. It was a very interesting program. It was easy to navigate. It was fun. The children's the children really uh, gravitated toward it. They actually found out what occupational um, skills they were in tune to, and they were interested. And I begged Mr. Summers, I said, please, please don't let this go to sleep. Push this thing, push it. But um, he didn't push it, but <laughs> it's still over there at the house waiting for somebody to get it. But it, it's, really, it's really a good program. Uh, even today, because people, most people don't know what they want to do, you know, especially young people. Yeah, we can use yeah. it now. Monica yeah, Summers? Are you in contact with uh, those kids? Because oh, yeah, no. They must appreciate a lot what you did for them. I'm sure they did, yeah. I'm not in contact with them, but I'm sure it, it, it has had an effect upon them, that's for sure. Okay. What role has your family played 
in your artistry and in your career as an artist? Well, my family, starting with my mom and dad, um, wow, you know, I, you know, I can't tell you how important it is for parents to love their children, mm -hmm. to love your child unconditionally and let that person bloom and blossom because my parents did that to me. And let me tell you something, this is kind of funny, but it, this is a true story. My father was extremely handsome. I mean, if he walked in here right now, you all would be like, dang. He was like Clark Gable handsome, you know. And uh, my mother was a good looking woman too. So when they had me, I wasn't the cutest little baby, you know. I was one of those serious looking little babies that, um, just a serious, solemn looking baby, you know. I wasn't one of those hoochie coo, and I was like, you know, I was one of those kind of babies. So anyway, people were talking about me, and my father wasn't having it. You know, talking about his baby. So my father would tell me, you my baby, you my rose. You know, and then as I grew, I became, I was skinny, so he called me skinny. You my skinny. Well, that did something to me. That made me feel so special. And my mom was the same way, you know. I, I had a, um, I was in the chorus in the sixth grade and I had to sing a little solo part. And I was so scared, I was scared to death. My mom said, oh honey, don't be afraid of people. They're people just like you, they scared too. I said, really mama? Yeah, baby. I was like, okay. So my point here is, children believe what their parents tell them, intensely so. So I'm so fortunate that my parents told me good things about me. So I felt like I had to live up to it. So that was my first support. And I'm gonna tell you, when I first started painting, I was intensely interested in the human reproductive system, I put it that way. And I had all kinds of things happening in the paintings. And my parents put it on the wall anyway. They were so proud of my work. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> then when I went to Michigan State, mm -hmm. I was like, well, I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. But my, I'm going to stick with the subject okay. of the family. So my family was very instrumental in encouraging me to embrace my love for art. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, um, brown paper bags was my first um, palette or canvas, mm -hmm. and I basically painted on, on shades that were on the window. I would take the shades off the window. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some pieces of wood hanging around. I would paint on it, on um, the brown paper bags, anything I get my hand on. This is way before I got a hold of just some regular white paper. For some reason, I don't understand why I didn't have white paper, but that's what I did. So bringing it back to this time period, uh, I met my husband at Michigan State and he hired me as an artist, as I brought out before. And um, he's been supportive ever since. I mean, he's been pushing me, gently pushing me through the process. And I'm gonna tell you something. I don't think I'd be here today, right now, having this artist talk if it wasn't for L, because I, L encouraged me in, 19, in 2019 to take an art class, or was it 2018? You know, somewhere around there. And I was fighting them every step of the way. I'm like, I don't need a art class. I'm busy. I got enough stuff on my pellet. He said, no, I'll take the class. Take the class, Rose. <laughs> and, I, and I thought about it. I said, you know what? Every time Elle tells me or encourages me to take an art class, something beautiful happens. So I'm going to listen to him. And I took the class under Mr. Alfred Sonnenberg. He, him and Elle have the same name, Alfred. And I asked Mr. Sonnenberg, who happened to be from Germany, and he worked for J.L. Hudson's art department for many, many years. And he said to me, I really don't know why you're in here. And I said, what? He said, really, I, there's nothing I can teach you. That's what he told me. I said, well, I'm here to be tweaked. <laughs> so if you can tweak me, tweak me. And so he said, well, where do you need tweaking? So I said, I want to tweak the eyes. He said, okay. I said, I need tweaking with the hands. And um, he said, oh, the hands are easy. You know, you just, you just draw the, the rectangle, and then you just draw the little appendages off of there. Like, and it was so easy. And I was like, yeah. 
dang, why did that take so long? You know. But anyway, he was very good, and he really encouraged me. And from that point on, things just started popping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and my daughter has been extremely um, helpful and useful in the art encouragement field, so to speak. Always there, always loving. Love you, honey. Thank you, family. Applause, round of applause for family. Yeah, got to have that. Shout out to Mr. Summers. Mm -hmm. uh, you created a book. I sure did. Yeah. Forgot to bring it. <laughs> well, I still would like to, well, we all would like to hear about it, because I know that came through education as well, right? Yes, yes. Um, You're somewhat of a rebel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, working um, on the master's degree, almost finished with it, I uh, had a class that uh, we had to learn about um, elementary school children's books. And one of the, the um, people that we learned about was psychologist Bruno Bettelheim. And I became fascinated with his uh, knowledge of fairy tales and, and rhymes, you know, like Humpty Dumpty said on the wall, what really does that mean? And uh, so we learned all of that in this class. And so they gave us a project. and. I said, you know what, I want to create a book. So the teacher said, what you do is you choose a, a fairy tale that has no pictures to it, and just the storyline, and you create the entire book, the pictures along with the storyline, which I did. It was so beautiful. It was called The Fairy Princess, and, 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 you know, and I was able to make the princess and all the little creatures that was in the, the um, fairy tale. So, I really enjoyed the book. That was the only book that I actually created. I still have it. I meant to have brought it today so you all could see it. Well, but um reason for them to come back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll put it online, you know, so they yeah. can see it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just think it's delightful just to kind of sit and crack open your head because you really mm -hmm. are just a creative person in general. Um, what influences your style? Across the board, because you, you got into fashion design, you do jewelry. You, yeah. <laughs> you do illustrations. Yeah. What influences your style, Rose Mary Summer style? What influences my style? I really don't. <laughs> I think the influence is. Um, I think part of the influence is my uh, African heritage. Okay. Um, Mr. Paul Goodnight, he says to me, he said, Rose, if you ever go to Africa, oh boy. They're not going to be able to stop you mm. once you get that stimulation. Mm -hmm. So I'm basically influenced by my environment, um, pretty blues, you know, the blue oceans, um, clouds. I'm a cloud watcher. Mm -hmm. You know, here in Southfield, because of the way they build the buildings, for some reason the sky looks lower. And the clouds are just wonderful. If you ever want to just do some cloud gazing one day, the formations are beautiful. But So things like that influences me. Um, of course, uh, African peoples, the bright colors that they wear. You know, uh, a, a while back, I used to wonder, why would they put a plaid with a floral print? Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of these different colors that were mixed matched in my mind. Mm -hmm. But as time progressed, I began to really enjoy it. It was like a form of artistry. And so thusly, in some of the paintings right here in this room today, you see those patterns that, that I uh, used to study. So my art is influenced by people I meet, situations I find myself in. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the themes are relationships, love, uh, people, women, sometimes men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You do paint a lot of figures. Is there a reason for that? Is it just the love of people? You know, my first piece, and, and we're going to pass this around, this is my first masterpiece. Uh, so in, I was 17 years old. This was 52, 53 years ago when I painted this painting. And it, when you take a look at it, it looks basically like the work that I have here in the gallery. I love the human face. I'm just enamored with the fact that we all have a different face. Mm -hmm. 
you know. It just trips me out. I like, and I love the fact that we have eyes, you know. And so those two things um, really motivates me to paint uh, the human expression, like Margaret Keene, um, big eyes. Uh, she created uh, those beautiful images of young people with the big eyes. And I, when I first saw them, my mother bought some at a and Oh, really? Yeah, they were everywhere. <laughs> they were everywhere. And uh, so she bought a couple of the posters at the A&P, and I was, I was like, I can do these big eyes, you know. And so I was just uh, impressed by that. And still, it's very hard for me to paint without putting a face in the painting or some type of figure in the painting. Well, it, it's obviously it's, it comes through, but I think what's so dynamic about them is how expressive they mm -hmm. are um, within their facial expressions, but every component that you have going into the piece. I've told you before, it's like a, like a one-page storybook or like right. a song. Yes, yes. Can you tell us, can you share with us how is that on purpose, <laughs> or how you come to create these intriguing well pieces? I am going to talk about this painting right here. It's called Ashley's. Uh, it's called the Sack, and it's about a young girl who was torn away from her mom. And I'm trying to find my little thingy. I thought I had put in here me and this note that I can never keep up with. But anyway. This painting is called The Sack. And, and this painting represents a true story that actually happened to a young girl named Ashley. And that's Ashley over there by the hand of her mother. Her mother is sitting in a chair, actually. You can't really see the mother, but you see her hand. And initially, when I painted this pa painting, I did have the mother's full face. She had a pink head wrap on. She was holding a little baby. But I was compelled to cover her face up. Little did I know, my husband had been doing, reading this book about this little girl named Ashley and how she was torn away from her mom when she was nine years old. And her mother gave her this sack. And on this sack, she embroidered, uh, I will love you always. And so she also put uh, five handfuls of pecans in the sack. She put uh, a piece of her hair, a braid of her hair in the sack, and an old tethered dress she put inside that sack. So Ashley kept this sack everywhere she went. By 19, this is, we're talking the mid 1850s, 60s, something like that. So by the time 1921 came around, Ashley's great granddaughter, had the sack. Middleton, I remember her name is Middleton. And she made sure that um, um, this sack, would, you know, she kept the sack, but, but some kind of way after the 20s, 1920s, this sack wound up at a secondhand store here in 2022. And uh, a lady f was in a secondhand store looking through old fabrics saw the sack, and she had the mind to say, hmm, this looks familiar. This looks like it's important, because the embroidery was there. The words were embroidered on this tattered cloth. She took it to the Smithsonian, had it authentic authenticated, and they said this is actually a real, the real deal. So now it's at the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. And so what's interesting about this whole thing is I'm painting this painting. Mr. Summers is telling me about the sack. And it just, it clicked. And I was like, wow, it just kind of blew me away because I had, you know, I had the mother's face there. And then I got rid of the mother's face. And then Ashley popped out. So I was like, wow, this whole painting kind of just developed on its own, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a real true story, and there's a book about it. If you Google Ash Ashley Sack, you'll find the author of the book who's written about this woman's, it's fictional, of course, but her experience as a nine-year-old being separated or taken away from her mom.
Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Ian Grant. Y'all so good. Come on now. <laughs> Stop doing that. All right, let's hear it for um, Rosemary. That was just part one. Um, that was a beautiful story. And um, again, our art. So much history goes with her art, and she has to take time to research everything. So what we wanted to do was maybe take like five minutes, five to ten minute break, so you get a chance to walk around, take a look at the art. In addition to that, we have some wine and some drinks back here, chips, different things of that nature. We just wanted to say Rose this month has been really, really exceptional. She was featured on the front cover of Black Magazine, as you can see right here. Okay and all throughout the magazine. She was also featured in the Michigan Chronicle, the Southfield Sun, Channel 7 was here already, and in the next week or so, we're gonna have Channel 4 here, and some other specialties for Rose, so her prominence and her art is really growing, so please take some time to mingle for a minute. Anything that you see that you like, please let us know. If you see a red dot, and there's a lot of red dots here, that means that it's already sold. We also have another room over here called Exhibit A. In Exhibit A, um, that's where we have some special paintings so you can get the opportunity to take a look at that. So um, please take a little time just to mingle a little bit, and we'll have you back together in the next five to ten minutes to hear part two of Rosemary. And again, anybody that makes a purchase today, whether it's a print, we have prints in the hallway, or an original painting, you will receive a, a signed copy of Black. This is Black Love. Black love will keep us together. You have to be very, very skillful with black love. As you can see, she got you on the checkerboard, not the chessboard, because we grew up playing checkers, right? Okay. All right. So let's get five minutes in. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Well, welcome back. Uh, welcome back to part two of the Rosemary Summer Start. Rosemary Summers Talk, Artist Talk, <laughs> here at Umoja Fine Arts Gallery in Southfield. Um, I'm hosting. I'm your host this evening, afternoon, Calibra the Artist, and of course we're here with the fabulous Rosemary Summers. Thank you. Clap it up. We're not about to do Miss Rosemary like that. <laughs> you just swept and swept within 10 minutes, came and put... Ten more dots on the wall, <laughs> and these paintings are not cheap, so I know you guys are fans, so show her that love. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, before we, where we left off, mm -hmm. actually, Mr. Grant touched on it. I wanted to dive into your recent success, Yes. Um, which you've had a lot of. Yeah. <laughs> Phenomenal. <laughs> you come back into the art world, um, in this form, the fine art world, mm -hmm. and knocking people down. Yes. Um, like he mentioned, you've had press all over, mm -hmm. um, had the cover of Black Magazine. Which is absolutely beautiful. I'm so up. thankful for yes. that. <laughs> That's a very his beautiful historical piece. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you the story about this. Um, Mr., um, the publisher of Black, Mr. Mm -hmm. Billy Strauder, came into the gallery uh, several months before this came into fruition, and he saw a painting I did called um, When um, Harriet Calls, and he was just blown away by my style. He really loved it. And so he, he, he met with Mr. Grant, and he wanted um, to commission me to do a piece for February 2022, Black History Month, the cover. And ironically, I had already created it in December of this of 2021. So my husband is the one that brought it to my attention. He said, Rose, you already have a black love piece right here. And I was like, well, hot diggity dog, there it is. <laughs> and um, Mr. Strauder saw it, loved it, and the rest is history. So. Mm -hmm. That's how it came into being, yeah. And shout out to Mr. Summers again. Yeah, Mr. <laughs> Summers. Because he's the man behind the scenes. Just mm -hmm. kind of putting those little bugs, it sounds like. Yeah. But you pick them up and then dunk them. Yes, <laughs> so. yes, yes. Okay, so you're in your current exhibit um, mm -hmm. with Umoja Fine Arts. You've been with them for how long? Uh, since 2019. Mm -hmm. And how has that been, being picked up by Major Oh, Gallery? my goodness. Um... You know, when you do your research about uh, African-American artists, and there are so, so, so many artists out here in the art world, 
Um, just to have the honor to be here in this gallery, to be affiliated with this professional entity called Yamoja Fine Arts, I'm just absolutely grateful and honored because when Mr. Grant suggests that I be paired with um, Mr. Paul Goodnight, international artist Mr. Paul Goodnight, who's had his work on television shows and is in prominent uh, people's homes all over the world, I was like, are you serious? You can't be serious. And he said, yes, yeah, so I want you to go into the belly, <laughs> and I want you to pull it out. I said, is he serious? You know, go into the belly. And when he said that, it clicked in me that I could actually do that. Mm -hmm. And so I said, oh, yeah, wait a minute, hold it. I forgot I can go into the belly. Because prior to 2019, I, you know, was a member of, uh, and still is a member of the um, Detroit Fine Arts Breakfast Club. And I was coming to the club showing, showcasing my jewelry, my jewelry art. And it took me a whole year to realize that I was an artist again. It's like the little artist was asleep. And then it dawned on me one day at the club. I said, wait a minute, I'm an artist. At the club? Yeah, I was oh, at the club. the breakfast club. The breakfast club. <laughs> Forgive me. So once I came into that realization, um, I started painting again. This is in late 2018, early 2019. Had um, participated in the um, Palmer Park Art Fair. It was very successful. Uh, Channel 2 came out and did, you know, an interview. And then Mr. Grant invited me to have a show here with Mr. Paul Goodnight on November 1st, 2019. I met Mr. Goodnight. We were like relatives. And, um, you know, the rest is history. It's like that began the journey. And then I, I was selling also my art online on my Facebook page and, and my um, website that my beautiful daughter created for me. So I was pushing it. And um, all of you who are artists and you want your work to sell, you have to push your work. Um, don't get into the mindset of thinking, oh, I'm bothering people. We are all bothered at this stage in the game. We just choose to pick what bothered we want to be bothered with. But stay visible. Stay visible, and that's what I did. I stayed visible online because two things happen. One, when you're visible and consistent, people begin to trust you. Mm -hmm. They're looking at you every day. They're saying, okay, she's... And then when I sell, I say sold, so they can see, oh, and she's selling. Mm -hmm. So that builds up trust in the um, potential collector. And also, remember, Sam, you get in a car accident, what happens? Who are you going to call? <laughs> call Sam. He's on TV every single day. It's been a long time, Sam. It's been on over 20 years. First his dad, dad's gotten old now, so the older son is taking his, you know, and I'm sure he probably has a son that's going to keep going. But the point of the matter is, Sam never said, oh, I'm bothering the people. It's too much. They don't need to hear about Sam. Sam is there every single day. So I'm like, Sam, that's my role model. I'm like, you know, I go to Facebook every morning. I know I have folk waiting on me to post, too. They're like, what's she going to post today? Mm -hmm. And I go, kabam! And they go, wow, love it! And that, and that fires me, mm -hmm. you know? And so I say to you artists out here, it's not hard to do. Just post a picture. Post your paintings. Post, 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 post. I'm glad you stopped with the eyes, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Suzanne uh, is mentioning, and I have to say this, Suzanne is something else. Suzanne is one of my collectors. She came and she bought the bird lady. And uh, I had an app that I can make the eyes move and the mouth talk. Oh, yeah. Oh, it, and it's really kind of cool, but Suzanne is like, I don't like this. <laughs> and then a couple other people told me, too, you know, 
don't do your art like this. <laughs> My brother, please stop doing it. Don't send me those without telling me. Don't send me. So I said, well, let me stop. This is not cute, even though I think it's cute. But, but, um, but yeah, so I didn't forget what you asked me, but okay. Okay, we, 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 we <laughs> dropped some jewels. Okay. You dropped some jewels, and I'm glad because I'm sure there are other artists in the room yeah. um, who, who feel the same way. Am, mm-hmm. I, am I doing too much? And you made a great point. I, I always hear, you should be driving a key. I'm not like, driving a key. You know, but <laughs> uh-huh. I hear it all the time. You yeah, know, and, yeah. and when we see you posting, it makes mm-hmm. us familiar with you, the artist, and it right. makes us look forward to your work. Yes. So thank you for There's that. a lot of power in it. Mm-hmm. You never know who's keeping up with you. Mm-hmm. I know there's a lot of people keeping up. Just don't know who it is. Well, we got a good idea. I know you got uh, some high-profile collectors. Yes. Um, I don't know if we can mention certain names, but that goes into your success. You've been all over the world. Yes. And with some some high-profile people. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned, you said you just want to stay warm. I just want to stay warm. Yes. What does that mean with relative to your success? You know, I was looking at an interview the other day, um, Jimmy Jam, the gentleman that um, promoted um, Janet Jackson, and they were interviewing him, and he and he said the person that was doing the interview said, "Yeah, how do you how do you feel being hot?" And he said, "I don't want to be hot." He said, "Well, what do you mean by that?" He said, "Cause you know, like when you're hot, then eventually you cool off, you know, then you disappear into the ethers like everything else, but." He said, I just want to stay warm. And I thought, oh, I like that, you know, because when you're warm, you can just kind of mellow yourself on through the process. You know, you don't anticipate something gigantula, but if it happens, that's cool. Um, you don't never see yourself really down. You know, you just stay at a nice balanced flow. So at this stage in my life, you know, in a few months, I'll be 70 years old. I want to stay warm. I can't be hot anyway. You know, I'm getting old. <laughs> but I like getting older. Right, Suzanne? Yeah, so, so that's why I want to stay warm. And like my friend, um, Margaret Keene, um, Big Eyes, she's in her 90s, and she has a museum in San Francisco because she stayed warm. So, you know, it's all about balance. It's really all about balance. I like that. And keeps you from burning out. It does. It keeps like you from that. getting ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I like that. Okay. Well, what's up? What's next for uh, Rosemary Summers? You blooming on your seventieth year? Yeah, on my se- <laughs> Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> well, you know, um, I'm just grateful to be here. I'm really grateful that Jehovah has given me this ability to create art. I actually prayed for it. I said, if you just give me a little something special to separate me from the rest. Mm -hmm. And it came, and I'm just so happy about it. So I just want to stay balanced. Um, I have ideas that flow in constantly. For example, Suzanne has a piece called Bird Lady. I wanted to do some more Bird Lady um, paintings, um, build on the series. So series that that I've created, they're like some series are ongoing series, Mm -hmm. like the Bird Lady series, then the T. John Hat Women, that's a series, and then there's a series about um, black males. So I have series of paintings that I've created along the way, so that'll keep me very busy, but um, I think I just want to continue to, to paint and get some of my work into the auction houses. Okay. Yeah, I feel real positive about that because there's a uh, artist, her name is Amy Cheryl, and she painted the, the um, painting of Michelle Obama and the beautiful dress that she wore, and at the time that she created that beautiful portrait of Michelle Obama, she was making about six grand her painting. Do you know how much money she's making now? This is, we talking less than four years ago, whatever. But she's making about her last painting sold from an auction house in New York City, $14 million. 
14 million. How are you going to go from six to 14 million? That's what that's happened. How are you about to go in about a year? For, for you guys that don't know, Ernie Barnes just sold yesterday his baby for 15.3 million. Yes, right. so this yes. Is very serious. Yes. It's growing very, very fast. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the name, that's the Sugar Shack. That's the Good Times picture, y'all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and that made my heart. That just warmed my right. heart. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. That's, that's Rosemary next year, y'all. Probably. Oh, well. <laughs> I wouldn't even know that. Y'all have to come pick me up off the floor. But um, <laughs> but the possibility of that happening mm -hmm. is real, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, African American art is like all of a sudden everybody is getting the sense of it, mm -hmm. you know. And so I'm just glad to be part of that. Mm -hmm. Because when you're younger, you don't think you actually have this opportunity. Sometimes you just, you know, it just don't add up. But then when it comes, when you get an imaginative person like um, Mr. Ian Grant, to, to, to do something as bold as put an artist, an unknown local artist, with an international artist and be okay with it, mm -hmm. that was a pretty bold move. I was like, wow, this guy's bold. I like that. I said, I think I can hang with him. So, you know, just stand warm. Yeah. This is because you touched on it. How does that make you feel that um, the African-American art market is, um, well, it's rising right now. From mm -hmm. A few decades ago, African-American art was considered arts and craft. It wasn't even a thing. And mm -hmm. now it's like rock and roll. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's hot. Yeah. How does that make you feel as somebody that's had a career that spanned as long as you mm -hmm. have? It makes me feel very good, and it makes me feel happy about the fact that um, people can purchase art and have and can work toward generational wealth for their children. Um, because you can purchase a piece of my art right now, for example. And who knows, in five years, you know, the piece you purchase may sell at an auction house for 50000 or 100000 I don't know. $14 million. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. But take good care of Bird Lady because we know of people who have purchased art in the 1980s and sold it. And mm -hmm. 300 grand is not bad, you know. So it's like uh, art is one of the hottest commodities. Uh, on the stock market right now. It's the one that's not going back and forth. It's like going like this. So um, invest in art. Mm -hmm. Invest in art. Especially if um, while you're looking at the artist, you're going to remember this day. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, it's a great investment. And I'm, I feel really good um, for African Americans um, getting a chance to play on the art field of life and people getting a chance to enjoy folks buying their work. Mm -hmm. I agree. I just want to add um, the importance of investing in art. Like Rosemary said, it's the hottest thing, not just stock, but with regards to assets, it's always been stock, real estate, art. It's mm -hmm. always been that way. It's just black art was not on that playing field. Mm -hmm. So now that we are invest. Mm -hmm. And the benefit to being with Umoja Fine Arts Gallery is Umoja is one of the leading um, sellers in black African-American fine art in the world. Yes. Um, not just in the country, in the world. They're one of the top sellers in original African-American art. So when you're looking to invest, seriously, this is really where you come. Mm -hmm. um, and it builds stars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and we, we are in a pandemic. Yeah, even though yeah right. We don't want to think of it as such, but... Uh, so Mr. Grant is doing well during this, this um, pandemic mm -hmm. because he pushes on, you know, he, he motivates his artists and he has a large vision. And so you just have to get on board mm -hmm. and, and, and know where your strengths are. So what I like about Yamoja is, is that we play our strengths. So whatever my strength is, that's what's coming to the table. His strength is coming to the table. Mr. Marcel Stewart, the manager, he brings his strengths to the table. So we focus on the strengths. And then when you collaborate, all of that wonderful energy, you get blooming in color. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just glad to be part of the, the family, the team. Mm -hmm. Now we all our time is almost done, but I did want to touch on you do have um, 
few philanthropic <laughs> endeavors. Mm -hmm. um, one including a scholarship. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, two of my scholarship awardees are right here in the audience. Um, yes. Um, so since I've been blessed with this wonderful um, art um, investment, however I want to call it, making some money. Yeah. <laughs> I've um, always loved to give to people, and I thought it would be a great idea to give to artists in the Detroit community who are in need of a scholarship. So my scholarship is called the Rosemary Summers Art Scholarship. And so this year's awardees, and you can stand, is uh, Mr. Malik Phillips and my friend Marta Carverdale. Marta? And so they both received a $500 scholarship, and it's for their supplies and whatever they need to get them motivated and stay focused on, on developing their artistic journey. And so next year, uh, it's going to be somebody else. I like to just kind of feel around and keep an eye out on certain artists just to see how they're developing and then uh, say, okay, this person is... Uh, is going to be one of the people that get the Rosemary Summers Art Scholarship. And basically what you do for the scholarship is just write me a one-page uh, narrative on why you feel you need this and what you plan to do with the funds. And it's a good tax write-off, too. I've got to have a tax write-off. And the galleries enter also. And, uh, beg your pardon? <laughs> <laughs> and the galleries enter also, or, or, right oh. or do you just have to be an artist? Only artists can enter. Only artists. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes, and then I, um, you know, I work with um, the Mint Artist Guild, mm -hmm. um, and I can't call her name. Um. Well, you just Vicky made, Elmer. Vicky Elmer. Vicky Elmer. Vicky Elmer. Elmer. <laughs> Elmer. If I wasn't doing art like I'm doing today, I would probably be doing what Vicky Elmer is doing, which is collecting together young people from the community, the Detroit community, and exposing them to art in many, many different ways. And so um, I donate to her organization. And I met a lady um, about two months ago, and she gave me a ton of art supplies to give to Vicki Elmer's um, children. So I like doing that. And then people, you know, just supporting people who need the funds for whatever reason. So uh, that's just part of who I am, what I love to do. And it just makes me happy. And there's a principal scripture in the Bible that says, when you give, you know, from the heart, it comes right back. And yesterday it happened. Remember I told you yesterday? And it just happened today, so. Oh, it's so sweet. So give, you know, give people to the folks. You know, don't be stingy. You know, you make pound cakes, give them pound cakes up here. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but honestly, honestly, it's just amazing. If you do it, you know, you do it uh, without the intention of getting back. Mm -hmm. Because if you give to people who can't really give you anything back, that's the mo most important part of it, mm -hmm. you know, because it comes right back around. Mm -hmm. It's such a marvelous vibe to be in. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm like, I don't understand why people don't get this. You know, but it's just a wonderful thing, and I'm glad I get it. So, And I'm glad that you all have come here to support me. And those of you who have purchased art today, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And continue to watch me grow here at Yemoja Fine Arts Gallery. Go to yemojafinearts.com. I'm always going to have new art there on the website, as well as my own website, rosemarysummers.com. And just going to keep this whole art journey moving forward. And I want to say... Uh, special thanks to Calibri because.
this, this beautiful young lady was the first recipient of the Rosemary Summers Art Scholarship. <laughs> and let me tell you, let me tell you, she just bloomed like a rose. I'm, I'm like, look at this woman. You know, I just could not believe, cannot believe um, how she's finding her niche, niche, and as broadcasting definitely is going to be part of it. She's an artist too, a, a very, very uh, masterful artist. And then she has this way about her. I wanted her to interview me today because I didn't want to just be rambling, talking like I'm doing now. But I, I wanted her to ask specific questions because her style is so cool and sultry. I like that. Is she cool and sultry? Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much, Calibri, for coming out. Thank you. <laughs> and bringing your staff. Thank you, staff, for coming and shooting us. So we'll be on, um, what is it, on, not on Facebook, but on uh, YouTube. YouTube. We'll YouTube. be on Facebook, too. We'll, we'll be on YouTube. And how can people art. find us? Um, you can find us on Get Down to Dirty Talking Art. You can find us on Danahan Arts, D-A-N-A-H-A-N. Um, and you'll be able to find us on Rosemary's page as well. Okay, well, well there you go. Okay. So thank you so much. Can I? Thank you. All right, I'm going to hand the... I just, I wanted to just leave because we all, I don't want to, you know, just one positive note, but mm -hmm. real quick, why art? Oh, why art? Mm -hmm. Well, we got to have art. There it is. <laughs> we got to have art. There it is. This Rose is what's getting us through the everybody. pandemic. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. You know, I just showed up and show out. And she said, why art? I'm continuing to put these red stickers up as we go along. We want to say thank you during the break. We sold six originals, um, four from Rosemary and two from Marcel. I know we're just getting started, and we just want to say thank you so much to Rosemary here. She went deep into the belly. She didn't tell you about the belly art. I got to tell you, this is where she creates from. She goes deep inside the belly, and yes, it goes back to Africa. This is how these colors are produced because of her nature and who she is as an African-American, but she has to go deep in the belly, past the belly button in order to create what she's creating. Um, again, we would say Thank you so much to Miss Calibri. She's always here to support Omoja Fine Arts, her and our entire team, Tish, everybody. We want to thank you for over the years now for being here and just all this support. Um, and for you people that are here today that's continuing to support Emoja Fine Arts and you're supporting a small black business and that's very key because we spin right back into our community. So with that being said, I would like you to know that on June 4th coming up, we want everyone to get one of these. Marcel Stewart will be having his art, artistic talk and he's more abstract in nature and he'll talk a little bit about abstraction and basically what he does when he goes rumbling around into the belly. That's like um, overall, if you're on the Moja team, you have to go deep into the belly. And we take the artists and we try to help expose them from one level to the next. If you can see where they were two years ago to where they are now and basically not only the art that they're producing, but the prominence that they develop around the United States. And then you take a look at the price points that they were at before they came to Emoja and the price points that they are at right now. Yes, we are trying to go for that 15.3 million. That's why we have connections with the auction houses in New York. So this is where we'll be taking our artists next as we continue on this journey. We want to say thank you to everybody. Continue to please look around. We still have red stickers up. Rose, I think you ran out of magazines. You played it lightly today, but you didn't know how much the people really loved you. Oh, yeah, so we're going to have to get more magazines yeah. to some people who might still purchase, okay? So okay. with that, we love you, and welcome to Emoja Fine Art. Let your friend and family know about your luxurious experience here at Emoja. Thank you. <laughs>